So it's my pleasure to be with you all today to discuss diabetic foot infections. And uh, all of us here in the room know this is so much of uh, a part of the um, of what we see in our day-to-day -day practice. Um, diabetic foot infections is really the bread and butter of infectious disease. So uh, we have a lot to talk about. Um, fortunately, I, I can promise you in this talk, there will be no dancing as in the Jardians commercial. So one of the pretty <laughs> guys. <laughs> So uh, let me just uh, make sure my slides are changing here. If you need me to help you change slides. There we go. So we have a lot to cover. Those are our objectives. And uh, so where are we in diabetic foot infections in the uh, early to mid 20s? Well, hot off the press, there's a couple of new guidelines documents that were just published in the last few weeks. There's the uh, International Working Group for the Diabetic Foot IDSA guidelines published in October of 2023. And there was also a similar document, Evaluation and Management of DFIs, published in August. So both of these documents, I think, uh, attempt to bring our management of, of diabetic foot infections into the 2020s. And um, so what is my take on this? Well, the, the new guidelines basically underscore the existing body of practice with some evolving changes in surgical and medical treatment practice. So where those apply, I have outlined them in bold yellow so we can talk about those and, and kind of ponder what they mean to uh, our, our practice with these patients. And as always, the goal should be to prevent major amputations. So these are the two documents. Now the uh, the working group IDSA guidelines for 2023 replace two documents, the 2019 working group uh, recommendations, which have been published every three years, and then the last diabetic foot infections guidelines uh, for IDSA were previously published in 2012. And this uh, article by Cortez Penfield, it, it's, an, it's an excellent article. I recommend everybody read it. It kind of encapsulates um, uh, a, a lot of the sort of the modern thought about treating diabetic foot infections, uh, the, both of the documents have some, uh, some differences which we'll cover. So the first thing, of course, I like to emphasize is if you're a primary care MD or if you're an infectious disease specialist, you're not treating these patients alone. Treatment of diabetic foot complications requires a multidisciplinary approach. There are more than 20 disciplines on this chart, and you can argue that every one of these is critical to the management of diabetic foot complications. So it really requires a team approach and you wanna make sure that you treat these patients as part of a team. Now, unfortunately, diabetes is not getting less common, right? Um, the latest statistics suggest that there are more than half a billion adults worldwide with diabetes in 2021. Um, that amounts to 30, more than 37 million diabetics in the US, that's, a, that's more than one in 10. Uh, in the U.S. population. There's a one to six percent annual risk of developing a foot ulcer. That's a 25 percent lifetime risk. And uh, up to a quarter of patients with a foot ulcer surprisingly require amputation. Uh, this places a tremendous cost on public and private payers. And uh, the diabetes prevalence, uh, this is kind of sobering. It's estimated that between uh, or about one in three U.S. citizens could have diabetes by 2050 if current trends continue. So it's been said that uh, diabetes is a common disease, but it's not a disease of just the common man. So all of these people <laughs> have diabetes. All right. So. Um, the, now we know that uh, the cost of a diabetic foot ulcer is profound. What is it exactly? Well, um, this is an article from 2016. Uh, Rice and colleagues, he looked at more than uh, 32,000 patients with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And uh, the, annual, the annual incremental healthcare costs of a diabetic foot ulcer at that time were between almost twelve to $17,000. And now these are in, uh, I think, 2014 dollars. So it'd actually be closer now in 2023. <laughs> to 15 to $22,000 per ulcer. So think about that. Think about how much you can save by ulcer prevention. And 
there's a tremendous uh, cost in, in work loss costs for these individuals who are sidelined and not able to uh, lead a productive life. What are some risk factors for foot ulceration and infection? Well, they're listed here. This is from the uh, uh, previous CID guidelines for 2004, a few years ago, but still apply today. Well, um, both, perf both peripheral and motor and sensory neuropathies play a role. Peripheral motor neuropathy can alter the anatomy of the foot and the biomechanics. We'll talk about biomechanics later. Uh, that can lead to excess pressure and form ulcers. Sensory neuropathy keep these patients from uh, perceiving when they're damaging their feet by stepping on nails or, uh, or other um, hazards. Autonomic neuropathy can uh, affect the health of the skin. Vascular insufficiency, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, limit blood supply to the foot, uh, inhibit wound healing, and uh, delivery of our antibiotics to the sites of infection. Um, hyperglycemia can have an anti-immune system effect um, and uh, can impair wound healing. And patients also bear some of the responsibility through their maladaptive behaviors. For example, uh, playing um, nine holes of golf with a golf ball in your shoe, as one of my patients once, once did, um, or ambulating excessively, uh, or wearing inappropriate footwear. And we here in the healthcare system bear some responsibility as well. So I, I always like to bring up this photo. This is uh, amputation as it was performed in ancient times. Um, some of you can imagine what this must have been like. Um, this was before the age of anesthesia, so patients had, maybe if they were lucky, they got a swig of uh, alcohol, and uh, at the surgeon's disposal were uh, some strong orderlies, a hacksaw blade, and a bucket. You can imagine uh, how patients uh, died of uh, the trauma and shock of the procedure and blood loss, uh, much less uh, the amputation itself. But unfortunately, amputations are far too common uh, in diabetic patients. Uh, worldwide, there's an amputation secondary to diabetes every 30 seconds. The latest data, more than 150,000 lower extremity amputations per year. And uh, men and, and racial and ethnic minorities uh, are disproportionately affected. And the costs are considerable, $60,000 for an amputation, uh, two billion a year in total costs. And again, these are um, uh, from uh, uh, older articles from 15 or 20 years ago, so the costs are probably even more at this point. Um, now, uh, the metabolic cost of uh, a lower extremity amputation on the diabetic patient is considerable. Think about the fact that um, a lower extremity amputation increases the metabolic work required for amputation while decreasing the overall efficiency of movement. And this happens in an environment where you have a patient who may already have other cardiopulmonary comorbidities that can affect their exercise capacity. And that fact is really reflected in these very sobering statistics. If you have any amputation, you have between a 53 and 100 percent rate, a five-year mortality rate. So you get an amputation due to diabetes, chances are 50% at best that you're still going to be around in five years. And the difference between an AKA and a BKA isn't really all that much. So whether you get an AKA necessarily or a BKA, you still have a significant risk of mortality um, in five years uh, when you have your first amputation. And these are risk factors for increased mortality, uh, things like renal disease, advanced age, previous amputations and uh, peripheral vascular disease. Furthermore, the, uh, the effects of amputation on the quality of life of a diabetic patient is profound. Many individuals regard amputation as a fate worse than death. I mean, we've seen some of our patients who say, uh, doc, I don't care what happens, you're not cutting off any part of my feet. You're not amputating a toe and uh, you're certainly not amputating my leg. Um, and there's a potential if you have an amputation for long-term physiological and psychosocial effects. Uh, patients lose their ability to do activities of daily living. Their physical activity is impaired. Maybe they were an avid pickleball player and now they can't play their pickleball. Uh, they become depressed. They lose social contacts. Their marital relationships can be affected. They may affect 
uh, may affect their occupational status and decrease their income, and they may be forced into early retirement. So let's talk a little bit about how diabetic ulcers occur. So um, the effects of uh, diabetic motor neuropathy on the distal foot causes an imbalance in the interosseous muscles, and that can thrust the MTP joints down and the IP joint up, producing what is called a what? A hammer toe. So um, when this happens, you have abnormal pressure um, in certain portions of the foot, and that can lead to tissue breakdown and eventually an ulcer. And once an ulcer forms, infection follows, and that can ultimately lead to underlying osteomyelitis. And osteomyelitis is oftentimes a precursor, as we know, to amputation. Now, we see a lot of patients um, in our facility with, uh, with this phenomenon. And, and this is a, another complication that we see in diabetic patients called Charcot arthropathy. How many people have heard of Charcot arthropathy? Raise your hands. So, so we know that Charcot arthropathy occurs usually because of uh, disordered um, uh, sensory innervation of the foot. And what happens is you have abnormal um, autonomic neuropathy, which increases blood flow into the foot. That's what results in some of that hyperemia that you see. And that actually accelerates the reabsorption of bone. And sensory neuropathy uh, causes these patients not to not be able to perceive the damage that they're doing to their feet with excessive ambulation. And that can lead to stress fractures, as we see right here. And um, so a, a Charcot foot, uh, oftentimes, uh, because of the changes to the foot, it, it causes an abnormal subluxation of the ankle joint, so they get a club foot appearance, and their foot can be very hot and swollen, and erythematous, and easy to dis easy to to uh, to not differentiate with underlying osteomyelitis. So someone may look at this foot and say, this patient has underlying osteomyelitis. They have, uh, you know, they have uh, uh, these uh, abnormal areas next to the MTP joints. Looks like there's infection there. And actually these patients don't require antibiotics. What they really need is, is uh, offloading, uh, usually with a total contact cast or a, a, not weight, a non weight bearing device. And that's going to resolve their situation, not antibiotics. Now, can some of these Charcot patients go on to develop osteomyelitis? Certainly. But uh, you need to be able to differentiate between Charcot arthropathy and, and osteomyelitis of the diabetic foot. And that could be different. That could be difficult, rather, uh, even with imaging. So as infectious disease specialists, we don't often do regular diabetic foot exams. You know, that's more in the realm of the ambulatory care or primary care doctor, but it's still important to know how to do a diabetic foot exam. And it's actually not that time consuming. You can do it in as little as three minutes and I'll go over it. Um, but most primary care providers should do diabetic foot exams at least annually. And uh, so um, probably the first component of this is uh, um, screening for neuropathy. And uh, how many people are familiar with the SEMS Weinstein monofilament test? Most people, I brought a little monofilament line here. Uh, I'm gonna pop it out of my bag. We use it in primary care. So, so it's a primary care practice. So this is a uh, um, this is a, a reflex hammer from a bygone era where a certain <laughs> pharmaceutical <laughs> company dropped this off at my office. And as you can see, it's a reflex hammer, but it has a very handy monofilament line right at the end. Yeah. I'll be putting this on eBay for uh, <laughs> post-Halloween profit. So, but uh, with the SEMS, if you guys want to pass that around, with the SEMS whites the monofilament test, it just simply applies yeah. a five or seven monofilament line to several areas of the foot. Inability uh, to be able to perceive that if you want to just pop it out and try to press it up against your hand, you can see what that feels like. Um, inability to feel that implies loss of protective sensation. Now, in recent years, a second um, more simple uh, test has been validated and is comparable to the SEMS Weinstein monofilament test. It's called the Ipswich touch test. And you it basically you uh, palpate the uh, tip of the first, third, and fifth toes with your finger. And uh, in a, again, inability to feel that 
applies loss and protective sensation. So you can use utilize either of these in your screening for neuropathy. So for the three minute diabetic foot exam, you spend one minute asking, you spend one minute looking, and you spend one minute teaching. So for the ask part, you take a good history for things like previous leg or foot ulcer, a previous foot wound requiring more than three weeks to heal, history of any vascular procedures, history of smoking or nicotine use, and uh, information about diabetes. You also ask them if they have any of these symptoms, like burning or tingling in the legs or feet, changes in skin color or skin lesions, loss of lower extremity sensation, and also if the patient has a podiatrist as well. Next, you do your exam. You look for things like discolored, ingrown, or elongated nails, signs of a fungal infection, which is very common in patients with poorly controlled diabetes, any open wounds or fissures, and uh, things like interdigital maceration, which can lead to ulcers. Also, you do your neuro you check for neuropathy with the Ipswich touch test or your monofilament test. You look for uh, joint health. And uh, you look for signs of uh, abnormal vascular supply, like, <clears throat> like the things shown here, like a temperature difference or palpable dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial pulses. And then lastly, you teach for a minute. Um, you give recommendations for daily foot care. Um, you educate regarding shoes because most diabetic patients don't really wear appropriate footwear. And um, you conduct an overall health risk management um, talking about smoking cessation and appropriate glycemic control. So, um, uh, so the three minute diabetic foot exam. And this is old data, but as you can see, um, we're not really doing very good in, uh, um, in medicine with uh, annual diabetic foot exams. Uh, in this study, the VA did much better than others. So we can be applauded for that. But uh, in my recent review of uh, recent CMMS data, um, there's nothing to suggest that these relatively modest uh, percentages have been proved at all. Now, there's no question that diabetic patients have uh, significantly increased risk of vascular disease. Uh, this has been shown in previous studies. Um, in fact, having diabetes is a risk for vascular disease that's exceeded only by smoking. There's also an increased risk of death in patients with uh, diabetes and peripheral arterial disease. So vascular disease is really bad news in diabetic patients. And this is one of my patients from years past who had a significant vascular complication. Now, these are all risk factors for diabetic peripheral vascular disease. The ones in red um, actually are not modifiable. You can't change your genetic predisposition, your age, or um, the duration of diabetes, but the rest of them are modifiable. And so we can educate our patients about these changes. And of all of these, of course, smoking is the most egregious. Um, you know, smoking <laughs> it induces atherogenesis, it uh, causes arterial vasoconstriction, and it induces clotting factors. Smoking cessation is really critical for these patients, but uh, especially among some of our population in our facility here, it's very difficult to get patients to quit. So um, many patients with diabetic peripheral vascular disease start with intermittent claudication. I'm sure everybody's familiar with intermittent claudication. It's kind of a, a cramping or aching sensation in the calf. Um, it's usually in, improved with recumbency and it's aggravated by exercise. Um, and intermittent claudication can progress to nocturnal arrest pain where patients tell you my legs ache at night when I'm sleeping, I, I, they may have to get out of bed, dangle their legs, or hop up and down to improve their vascular status. And nocturnal and rest pain is an indication for revascularization. So this is one of my patients from years ago um, who has some uh, vascular changes associated with uh, peripheral vascular disease, some skin changes. You, you oftentimes see very shiny, atrophic, cool skin. Pulses may be absent. Um, their legs may blanch on elevation. Uh, they don't have any hair on their feet because of the effects of uh, vascular ischemia. And uh, fungal infections and thickened nails are, are very common in this population. 
Now, how do we uh, diagnose diabetic peripheral vascular disease? Well, the gold standard is still contrast arteriography, but it isn't really used as much. Typically, we use non-invasive vascular studies, right? And these are typically the measurement of arterial waveforms and segmental pressures, including calculating the arterial radial index, or ABI. But in diabetic patients, sometimes uh, the ABI can be falsely elevated. In those cases, it's not really an effective test, but uh, we still want to get it, and, um, um, and it can be very helpful. Um, another uh, modality that we often see in our non-invasive vascular study reports are toe pressures. How many people remember seeing toe pressures in your report? So a toe pressure of less than 30 millimeters of mercury is associated with ischemic complications. And other studies are also advocated, the transcutaneous oxygen pressure and skin perfusion pressure, but we really don't use that here in our facility very much. It's typically the, the NIBS. So how do you measure an ABI? I mean, we get these numbers back, and how, how do we measure an ABI? Well, um, so for the typical patient, you cuff their left and right arms and their uh, left and right ankles, and then you take a Doppler flow meter, and you measure the systolic pressures in the right and left arm and at the posterior tibial and the dorsalis pedis arteries on both feet. And the ABI is calculated by the highest systolic pressure of either the posterior tibial or the dorsalis pedis over the right arm systolic pressure. So normal ABI is between 0.91 and 1.3. If it's over 1.3, that's associated with uh, calcified vessels. And uh, so um, you can't really use the ABI in those patients. Um, anything less than 0 0.9, 0 0.9 or less is associated with uh, arterial vascular disease. Severe arterial vascular disease is anything less than 0 0.40. And uh, poor ulcer healing is associated with an ABI of less than 0 0.5. So if you see a, a NIV study and it's less than 0 0.5, that's one of the reasons why maybe the podiatrist or the orthopedist, depending on where you work, um, doesn't want to do a surgical procedure because they're afraid that there's just not enough vascular supply uh, to heal the wound. Um, and these are patients that are candidates for revascularization before, um, before you do their, their procedure. So if you have intermittent claudication, it's not an automatic indication for revascularization. There's a lot of things you can do with medical management. Um, smoking cessation is, of course, the most important, but Leg exercises um, can improve um, the vascular supply, good diabetic foot care, treating hyperlipidemia, optimizing their blood sugar control, and, uh, uh, and periodic vascular lab reassessment is always important. Someone, if it's been a couple of years since they had uh, NIVs done, you want to make sure that you repeat them because things can change over that period of time. These are indications for revascularization. Um, intractable, disabling, nocturnal pain, non-healing, ischemic ulcer, or gangrene, all indications for revascularization. So remember those. Now, I used the term biomechanics before. What is the, what is the biomechanics of the diabetic foot? Well, the bi biomechanical factors are factors that can alter the structure or function of the foot that can lead to an imbalance in, in foot pressures. And whenever you have an imbalance, those are pressure points. And pressure points eventually can break down and lead to ulcers. So um, biomechanical factors that can lead to foot ulcers can be things simply as poorly fitting footwear. We know, for example, that uh, if you see a dorsal foot diabetic ulcer, it's usually because of footwear, right? Because typically those areas don't get pressure. Plantar surface, it's from abnormal pressure. The dorsal surface, it's their footwear. And so we, we can make simple changes to their footwear that can prevent the, the formation of a dorsal foot ulcer. Also, um, prior amputation, hammer toes, or charco fractures can all alter the structure of the foot, lead to weight imbalance, and produce an ulcer. And patients who don't get good diabetic foot care and, and have unmanaged plantar calluses can develop an ulcer as well. But other things like strength loss due to motor neuropathy, 
existing wounds or abnormal posture and gait can also biomechanically lead to ulcers. So we know intuitively there are certain areas of the foot that can be at highest risk for ulcers, and they're shown here. Um, a common pressure point is under the MTP joints or at the tips of the first or second toe. Also, the calcaneal pressure pad is also a common area for ulceration. You see a lot of these patients, calcaneal ulcers. I'm going to briefly talk on wound classification systems. Why? Because, you know, we all need a common framework of reference um, to describe the degree or severity of diabetic foot ulcers. And also, these can be helpful as predictive models to whether patients require a certain intervention. And uh, these are all classic or traditional classification systems dating back to the early 1980s. Um, some of these have evolved into different classification systems. The Wagner system was the original, and then you had the, the University of Texas, the PETAS, and the Sinbad. But um, the two classification systems that were advocated in those recent two publications that I talked about, first of all, for the Cortez Penfield article that came out in August, they really loved this um, Society for Vascular Surgery Wi-Fi classification system. Um, and this has nothing to do with your internet connectivity. It actually stands for Wound Ischemia and Foot Infection, and it's a variant of the 2012 IDSA criteria. And um, so it looks at a scoring system based on the severity of the wound, the presence of ischemia using uh, your ABI, and also the clinical manifestations of infection, and it allows you to predict the risk of amputation and the benefit of revascularization, which is all here in this table too. Furthermore, um, the article says that the infection scoring component, that third one where it says foot infection, clinical manifestations of infection, also can help you to predict which patients will, um, will require hospitalization and amputation. So you can find this in the Cortez Penfield article, and I have links at the end of this talk. This is the, um, the uh, classification system advocated by the recent working group IDSA guidelines that's uh, validated as part of the PETIS classification system that I, I talked about earlier briefly. And um, so according to this table, if you have, if you're in category three or moderate, or if you're in category four or severe, um, you're candidates for hospitalization. Category three, if you have associated risk factors, and category four, all comers. So it helps you to determine, do, does my patient require hospitalization for their, uh, for their diabetic foot infection? And so you can use this to help validate whether you feel a patient should come in the hospital. And uh, so if you're, if you have osteomyelitis, they add a zero in parentheses to the end. So if you're a severe diabetic foot infection with osteomyelitis, you would be a four followed by a zero in parentheses. So that's how you use this, this classification system. So let's move on and talk about infection. After all, we're infectious disease specialists. That's what we do, right? Well, once infection occurs in a diabetic ulcer, it's the single most common factor leading to amputation. And telling and, and being able to tell whether infection is present is more difficult in diabetic patients because of their altered physiology. They don't oftentimes react in the same way. So you might not necessarily see a leukocytosis. You may not see, see as much local inflammation. Um, all these things can be altered. And um, when we collect cultures, we know intuitively that superficial cultures are often in, in, inaccurate and deep cultures are preferred. And lastly, oftentimes our biggest responsibility is defining the extent of the infection. It's just, just, just a simple ulcer or is there an underlying osteomyelitis and how to what degree is the osteomyelitis present? So the, the, the modern thinking about the role of microorganisms in the diabetic foot ulcer is depicted here. So basically, uh, when you have an open diabetic foot wound, it first the first step is becomes contaminated with microorganisms leading to colonization. And these bacteria alter the wound environment and negatively affect healing. So the reason why 
your diabetic foot ulcer isn't healing is it's colonized with bacteria that are interrupting the kind of that cellular matrix, um, particularly by the establishment of biofilms. And these biofilms, they don't re they're not really cleared by antibiotics alone. So for that reason, you have to have physical debridement of the wound in order to disrupt the biofilm and allow healing to occur. And that's why treating diabetic foot infections is a, a two-pronged approach. It's just not medical. You need to have that team, including your surgeon, to uh, debride that ulcer and uh, interrupt that biofilm. So these are some different categories of uh, foot infection syndromes. What are the most common causes of diabetic foot ulcers bacterial-wise? Somebody yell out an organism. Staph. Staph aureus, right? And beta hemolytic streptococci are also uh, Im important as well. So kind of the cornerstone of our, our antibiotic management of diabetic foot infections is gram-positive therapy for these two types of organisms, right? But if you have other categories, that palette of organisms may broaden. For example, if you have an infected ulcer that was previously treated with antibiotic therapy or is chronic, it may be colonized by Enterobacterolis. Um, if if uh, it's been macerated because of soaking, you want to add Pseudomonas aeruginosa. If you have somebody who's previously been on broad-spectrum antibiotic therapy, you may want to think about um, a broader palette of microorganisms, a mixed infection. And then sometimes we come across very fetid or malodorous feet, and then you want to think about um, your mixed aerobic gram-positive cocci, uh, non-fermentative gram-negative rods, and obligate anaerobes as well. So because the infection response is modified in the diabetic patient, what are some early clues that you'll see? Well, Drainage is, a, is certainly a, an important sign. Um, erythema may be present or it may be absent. Sometimes uh, wound malodor, that's a sure sign that there's an infection present. Lymphangitis and lymphadenopathy may, may be a subtle sign. And uh, if you see tissue necrosis and, and gangrene, um, that's perhaps more obvious. And leukocytosis is helpful when it's present more so than when it's absent because sometimes these patients don't really mount a significant leukocytosis. Now, um, when osteomyelitis occurs, it's often an immediate precursor to amputation. Um, most diabetic foot osteomyelitis is, occurs as a result of a contiguous focus. They develop an ulcer. Um, they have exposed bone, and osteomyelitis follows. Hematogenous osteomyelitis in these patients is, is much less common. And um, you want to consider things like the anatomic location, the patient's vascular status, the extent of soft tissue and bony destruction. Also patient preferences. So there's a lot of shared decision-making and what you want to do with these patients. How about diagnostic procedures for, uh, uh, for diabetic foot osteomyelitis? Well, the recent uh, uh, two uh, documents, I think really um, have the tendency to want to place our diagnostic studies into a, a kind of a hierarchy of a first line and a second line approach. So the, the studies that are considered first line, when you first evaluate a patient with diabetic foot osteo, number one, the probe to bone test, number two, your plain x-rays, and number three, your biochemical markers, your inflammatory markers. So um, many of us are familiar with the positive probe to bone test. Uh, this was uh, uh, Grayson's uh, landmark study in uh, the 1990s in JAMA, that the ability to probe a exposed bone in a diabetic foot ulcer has a positive predictive value of 89% for the diagnosis of osteomyelitis. So what that means is if, if you have exposed bone, you can probe it with a sterile metal probe or a sterile Q-tip as we often do. There, and you say there's osteomyelitis Present there, there's only a 10% chance, chance you're going to be wrong. The tendency is there's going to be osteomyelitis there. And sometimes a positive probe to bone test is enough for us to treat for osteo. Plain x rays, however, have relatively more modest sensitivity and specificity, but, but their, their sensitivity increases if you do serial x rays. And inflammatory markers can be helpful as well. More so, again, when they're present than when they're absent, because sometimes inflammatory markers may not be elevated in these patients. 
if these first line studies are not that clear, then you want to go to your second line studies. And MRI is the modality of choice that we tend to use in our facility. PET scans are, extreme, are extremely helpful, and TAG WBC scans and SPECT scans can also be useful in some of these patients who may not be candidates for MRI. So uh, uh, Din and colleagues in 2008 uh, published this study in CID, Diagnostic Accuracy of the Physical Examination Imaging Test for Osteomyelitis Underlying Diabetic Foot Ulcers. And as you can see, the MRI had the overall highest sensitivity and specificity Look at that odds ratio, it's, it was pretty good. But when you look at the, uh, the odds ratio of just a positive exposed bone or probe test, you can see how useful this test is compared with the others. And uh, a bone scan, again, has relatively modest specificity, very high sensitivity. One of the reasons why maybe it's fallen by the wayside in favor of MRIs, but when you combine a, a bone scan, with a TAG WBC scan, it can be more helpful. And, and uh, years ago, when I was practicing in another medical center and we didn't have MRI, we used bone scans and lymphocyte scans. So they're always an option um, for, uh, for these patients. But definitely your MRI and your exposed bone are, um, are extremely valuable in diagnosing osteomyelitis in these patients. Dr. Yes. Is that acute osteo or both chronic and acute osteo? Well, I think, you know, we're, we're we're generally talking here about acute osteo, and chronic osteo may um, may have some differences in um, in terms of diagnostic studies. I still think these uh, studies are helpful because, for example, I think the sensitivity of plain radiographs may go up in chronic osteo because these patients are more likely to have bony erosions. Um, and uh, um, but exposed. Bone, I think, is, is an excellent study for both acute and chronic osteo. So, um, so we're talking specifically about acute, but I think chronic osteo generally follows the same approach. So, um, uh, so what are the general principles of treatment with diabetic foot osteomyelitis? Well, they're listed here. And, um, uh, and so surgical debridement, extremely important part of managing these patients with a DFO. And I want to differentiate resection, which involves the end block resection of, of uh, the involved bone with a, with a significant and adequate margin, which is potentially curative with debridement, which is more of a piecemeal, piecemeal whittling away of infected bone where it's not anticipated that all the osteomyelitis will be removed. So really have to identify, is this patient getting a debridement or a resection? <laughs> Now, the recent working group um, IDSA guidelines um, do emphasize the importance of early surgical debridement for moderate and severe diabetic foot infections. And here in our facility, we have that support and we do get uh, a good involvement with these patients with a moderate, moderate or severe diabetic foot infection. And that's why I highlighted in yellow, it's, uh, it's in the new guidelines. We want to restore circulation if it's severely impaired. So that's our other teammates on the diabetic foot infection team, the vascular surgery team, and we want to give antimicrobial therapy. And um, there's been recent studies that validate as little as three weeks of antibiotic therapy, IV and PL, in some of these patients with uh, uh, diabetic foot infections um, where uh, they have debridement and there's a small margin of osteomyelitis, you can do as little as three weeks therapy. And that's kind of a shocker to what our typical practice has been. And you wanna treat with empiric antibiotic therapy, but then narrow your therapy based upon invasive cultures. So there's actually several different types of debridement. And of all of these, sharp surgical debridement is the most important, right? Um, time and time again, um, clinical experience and, uh, and the literature has suggested that sharp surgical debridement with a scalpel is the most beneficial. But um, when sharp surgical debridement isn't possible, you want to talk about mechanical debridement, which usually involves wet to dry dressings. You put a, a moist uh, gauze on your patient's wound. Um, it dries out. And then when you remove it, it debrides the wound. Also, uh, pulse towel irrigation or lavage biochemical debridement, which involves hydrogels and enzymatic agents, 
and then biological debridement, which involves larva. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so larva is still helpful for some uh, for some wounds. And still see some of our surgical colleagues utilizing a larval. <coughs> so, um, what are the essentials of management in terms of antibiotic therapy? Well, I've outlined this in in yellow. But the new working group IDSA guidelines say that if you have a mild diabetic foot infection in an antibiotic naive patient, somebody who resides in North America or Western Europe, they say that you can recommend coverage for only aerobic gram positives. So rather than putting your patient on vancomycin cefepime, you can just put them on vancomycin and, uh, and, and treat them for um, for osteomyelitis. So I think this is something that, you know, we should definitely take to heart because single agent therapy is certainly a lot more approachable to patients than covering them broad in all cases. Now, of course, you want to include coverage for MRSA and Pseudomonas in more complicated cases. But if you have these simple cases, consider gram-positive therapy as well. And you always want to maintain awareness for the possibility of drug-resistant gram-negative rods. In our facility, we have a lot of drug-resistant granulated rods, and sometimes we need to, when we make these recommendations, we need to look at their background and what their previous cultures have shown, and also what their invasive cultures have shown as well. And you want to, again, base your specific therapy on invasive cultures or biopsies. Now, um, essentials of management for diabetic foot infections. You have to coordinate management with your surgical colleagues, right? Because um, a lot of times when we start antibiotic therapy is going to depend on when the surgical procedure occurs. Um, but the new guidelines say that you can consider <coughs> antibiotic treatment without surgery in these cases, if you, in, in this case, rather, if you have forefoot osteomyelitis without immediate need for IND to control infection, you have no peripheral arterial disease and no exposed bone. So... <laughs> These are cases where you can do antibiotic therapy only and treat your patient with the blessing of the uh, guidelines uh, writers in this case. So again, this opens up a lot of patients who may not need uh, uh, surgical intervention um, and you just need antibiotics. And the, the rationale behind this is very simple. Um, the guideline authors say that a lot of patients don't want any procedure whatsoever. And they're much more likely to, to be um, open to a course of antibiotic therapy um, as a trial. And then if they don't respond, that's when you consider other interventions, like do they need a debridement at that time? But in these simple cases, you're not talking about limb critical therapy, where if, you, if your therapy fails, they're going to get an amputation. These are more limited um, toe amputations if, if amputation is needed. This is a busy slide. It's in the new guidelines, so I, uh, you can refer to it, but it basically um, takes different clinical scenarios and recommends empiric antibiotic therapy according to the clinical presentation and microbiological data. So um, uh, again, you can refer to this in the new guidelines if you're thinking about what should I start this patient on empirically. Now, um, I know there's been a subject in your mind as you've been watching this talk. What about oral antibiotics, right? We've been thinking about that. So um, oral antibiotics are gaining favor for, with uh, the treatment of diabetic foot infections. And uh, according to the recent guidelines, their non-inferiority has been demonstrated in at least eight randomized clinical trials. And the most notable that some of you may be familiar with is the OBIVA trial which stands for Oral Versus IV Antibiotics for Bone and Joint Infection. Um, it was published in the New England Journal in 2019. And the OVIVA trial showed no difference in the long-term cure between an all-IV regimen versus a rapid transition to oral antibiotics. And we know that PO antibiotics offers considerable cost and safety advantages over all IV regimens. So what this trial suggests is we can consider the transition uh, to oral antibiotics in some of our patients who go home in IV, or even in cases where we start them on IV antibiotics in the hospital and then they go home on oral. And of course, you know, it has to be the right clinical scenario and we have to make sure that they can tolerate those oral agents, that they're gonna be compliant and that the antimicrobial spectrum that you're culturing uh, supports that change. But there's definitely emerging evidence that oral antibiotic therapy 
um, for most or in some cases all of our therapy um, may be the way to go. And how long do we want to treat these patients for? This is from the uh, 2023 guidelines. If you have a mild skin and soft tissue infection, um, one to two weeks of therapy um, with oral antibiotics is sufficient. If you have more of a severe infection, you may need to treat soft tissue disease for as long as four weeks. Um, maybe initially IV and then switching to oral. And then um, how about if you have a, a um, case of, of uh, diabetic toe osteomyelitis where it's been successfully and completely resected. Source control is achieved. Maybe you have a soft tissue infection that you're managing two to five days. How about if you have a debrided uh, infection um, just involving the soft tissue so it's more extensive, one to two weeks? And how about if you have bone resection but there's a positive culture or histology of bone margins? Um, the guidelines suggest as little as three weeks therapy. So not six weeks, but three weeks therapy. And the cases for six weeks, excuse me, um, six weeks that they advocate um, uh, are usually the worst case scenario where you have no surgery or dead bone. So should we always be treating for six weeks? I think these guidelines suggest that maybe we can go shorter, maybe four weeks, maybe three weeks. Um, so, and, and also they emphasize for a patient, patient's uh, recurrent diabetic foot infection um, to be considered a relapse requires a six month minimum follow-up duration. So um, you can't say they have a relapse until six months have occurred. Okay, so um, we're gonna move on here to how to get diabetic foot wounds to heal. So, um, so you get called for this patient, it's kind of a nightmare, right? What do you do with this patient? Um, are, they, are you gonna be able to salvage their foot? And uh, those of us who uh, have rounded here at the VA know that sometimes we see cases like this. And uh, uh, so um, an important component of, um, of diabetic foot management is getting diabetic foot wounds to heal. And that can be more difficult than we might otherwise think. Um, so we have to think in a very systematic approach. Why do some diabetic foot wounds not heal? Well, I think this is from the 2004 uh, CID guidelines. Um, think about the following. Was the appropriate tissue specimen obtained for culture? Sometimes our cultures just grow out coagulative staph and carinobacterium. Are those really the pathogens? If we're just covering for those, is there some other pathogen available? Um, is our antibiotic regimen sufficiently broad? Was the surgical debridement, drainage, or resection adequate? Did we achieve source control? Um, has the patient's metabolic status and wound care been optimized? And lastly, do they have adequate perfusion to their limb? It, are they being held back from healing their wound because they just have uh, too grave of a vascular insufficiency? Um, now, in the, in the olden days, they used to a lot, use a lot of, of um, really sketchy things uh, to treat wounds. Um, I think of all of these, maybe uh, zinc oxide, is, uh, um, is the only thing that's still in use. I would stay away from cow dung. Um, but if you have no wound supplies and you're not near CVS, you know, and you're out in some rural area and there's some dung on the ground, you know, why not just put it on the wound, right? So well, we've gotten better. And um, so this is a, a nice uh, publication, Bolton Diagnosis and Management of DFIs, published by the American Diabetes Association. And this is their guidance. They say wound dressings should uh, should combat biofilms with topical strategies that kill residual biofilm bacteria. So you got to kill the bacteria that produce the biofilm and you got to debride the biofilm. And then your treatments can shift to less aggressive topical therapies to reduce bacterial burden. And then when the wound bed is ready, you got to shift to advanced wound treatments that stimulate healing. So there's a lot of uh, different wound dressings that we come across when we evaluate these patients. And generally speaking, you can divide them into conventional and advanced dressings. So the conventional dressings are things like four by four gauze and packing strips. Again, they, um, they debride the wound when you use them as wet to dry dressings. Um, they're good for, for mechanical debridement and uh, 
And then um, to get wounds to heal, you can go to, to your advanced dressings. And the advanced dressings kind of follow the dermatologic principle. How many people have heard, if it's too dry, you wet it. If it's too wet, you dry it. The same thing here. I mean, if, you're, if your wound is too dry, you're, you don't have the ideal moist environment. So things like alginates or hydrogels kind of moisten the wound environment and they allow that healing to occur. But if your wound is excessively macerated and, um, uh, and there's too much exudate, then you want to use an absorbent dressing instead. So, um, so these wound dressings follow that principle. So um, the only way to really get to know these wound dressings is to work with them or just to pay attention to, to when they're, they're present in your, in your patient. In addition to the standard wound dressings, there are these adjunctive therapies that you will commonly see employed in diabetic foot management. And so I wanted to list several of them and go over them to kind of give you an idea of what's in use to get wounds, diabetic foot wounds to heal. And um, there's a variety of different categories here from uh, negative pressure wound therapy to skin grafts um, and uh, to oxygen therapy to shock wave and laser therapy. There's a little bit of snake oil here in, in some of this, as I think we'll find. But something that you see very commonly employed in our facility is negative pressure wound therapy or the wound back. How many people have seen the wound back being used? So the wound back is an alternative to wound dressings. And what it does is it, 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 they apply a, a wound back sponge into the wound, and then they create a negative pressure wound environment with the use of a occlusive dressing. And that um, applies continuous suction to the wound that draws out a lot of the exudate. It's also said to promote the development of granulation tissue and upregulate growth factor, I guess, because you're continually kind of debriding the wound. So that causes an upregulation in the wound regeneration factors. Um, and it's been proven by multiple clinical trials. Um, one thing to watch with the wound back is it requires regular management. You have to change the wound back sponge once a week. And if you don't, say you leave a patient at home with a wound back and the sponge doesn't get changed, you basically get a situation where, where you can get overgrowth of bacteria there and that can have a negative effect on, on healing. So it does re require regular active care and weekly sponge changes. So we certainly believe in the, new, in the, in the wound back in our facility. Now, um, this pleurogel is an example of a biochemical debrider. So it's supposed to be a surfactant that kind of prepares the wound bed, um, removes that biofilm, uh, hydrates the wound, and so some providers use uh, products like this. Low-level laser therapy is um, uh, has been in vogue, thought to accelerate wound healing by promoting cellular proliferation and decreasing inflammatory response. Uh, it does ablate the wound and it's bactericidal. Um, so that's one example. Again, I'm not necessarily promoting this therapy, just kind of sharing it. Um, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of therapy involves um, skin patches or skin substitutes. This, for example, the Leuco patch, it's a, a multi-layer patch made with uh, patient's own leukocytes, platelets, and fibrin. It's applied to the ulcer, and it's supposed to enhance tissue regeneration and get, and get that ulcer to close. So some providers use this as a modality. Hyperbaric oxygen has uh, been utilized for diabetic foot ulcers for many years. Um, its proponents say that it enhances healing through increasing tissue oxygen tension, it induces uh, blood, uh, bl blood vessel regeneration and has some antimicrobial effects. Um, and, uh, um, and remember that hyperbaric oxygen does not transcutaneously uh, permeate a wound. It increases the partial pressure of oxygen in your lungs, which in increases the partial pressure in your blood supply. And so it, it hyperoxygenates the wound that way. It's, it doesn't have a transcutaneous um, component. But, but really the, the recent guidelines say that uh, multiple studies, including two randomized controlled trials have shown no benefit for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So it's really coming out of vogue for most providers here at our facility, we've never had regular access to hyperbaric oxygen, so, um, so I'm not a personal fan, but uh, you may see this utilized for some wounds in other clinical scenarios.
A modality that does seem somewhat more promising is this cyclical tox topical oxygen wound therapy. Um, there was a meta-analysis of studies published since 2010 that show increased healing rates. This does involve the transcutaneous migration of oxygen into a wound uh, where they utilize this device with basically an enclosure over the, the wound. So again, this is not a modality we use here. I don't know if anybody in this room has ever seen this uh, utilized. It may be utilized in wound care centers, for example, but, but it does have some scientific basis and uh, you may see it more often in the future. Unfortunately, the 2023 guidelines discourage the use of any of these therapies, including negative pressure wound therapy, uh, basically on the basis of, of evidence, uh, the, the compendium of studies, or just calling them low quality evidence. So the recent guidelines are skeptical of things like bacteriophage therapy, negative pressure wound therapy, topical antimicrobials, HBO, um, they don't, they don't uh, talk about the cyclical uh, topical antibiotic therapy, however. But um, uh, so there, there is a lot of, of uh, provider preference or experience, but the jury's still out on any of these uh, based on the authors of the recent guidelines. They also don't give much alternatives in the guideline. They just say low quality uh, evidence. So, right. it's, not, so it's, it's frustrating, yeah. but, uh, but, you know, I think, um, some of this may go on our, our own provider experience. And remember, guidelines are guidelines. So I certainly have time and time again seen the benefit of negative pressure wound therapy for a lot of different wounds. So I'm not going to throw it out with the bathwater just based on the basis of these recommendations. But, uh, but I'm more likely to believe um, that things like topical antimicrobials or hyperbaric oxygen therapy to agree with their recommendations. So. Um, so, you know, we can all use our personal experience to rate these, uh, these recommendations. Um, and what are some post-treatment considerations? Um, we want to make sure that our patients, we don't ignore their need to improve their glycemic control. Um, and uh, we want to prevent recurrent ulceration by patient education, by maybe by guidance with their activities, you know, we want to encourage exercise in our patients, but if they have a diabetic foot ulcer, maybe ambulation isn't the best approach. You know, maybe swimming or or an, another uh, exercise program that that offloads their feet would be better. We want to guide and give them guidance on the therapeutic shoes. Maybe they need to modify their gait because they've had a, a transmetatarsal amputation, and so they need to modify the way the, the way they walk to even out the balance of their foot. So we want to prevent ulcers. Um, these are some continuing controversies that are outlined at the end of the recent guidelines. Um, how and when to determine that infection has resolved. Um, is there a further role of serobiomark serum biomarkers, sed rate, C-reactive protein, and procalcitonin? Um, can we further reduce the currently recommended durations of antibiotic therapy? Which advanced imaging studies are best? Does bone biopsy improve outcomes? I mean, intuitively, would Sydney would say yes, because it, it allows us to apply antibiotic stewardship to our treatment recommendations and simplify therapy, hopefully reduce side effects. What are the role of new antibiotics? We've had a lot of new antibiotics, particularly the beta-lactamase inhibitors and so forth, but they play a role in treating these patients. Um, how precisely does chronic biofilms play a role? Um, is Molecular microbiologic testing helpful in treatment outcomes. We have a lot of these molecular tests now that rapidly identify bacteria. Can they speed our, our treatment and intervention? And uh, again, further evidence on whether topical administration of antimicrobials works. And that can include um, the use of, uh, of antibiotic impregnated cement and antibiotic impregnated beads. A lot of times in our facility, we see these applied to the wound. According to the guidelines, there's not really a lot of consistent evidence that those help, but they're very popular. So further uh, data, maybe that, maybe there'll be further evidence in the next guidelines. So these are my, my resources for clinicians. Um, I'll share this slide with everybody. I'm happy to do it with email if you want to check out these guidelines if you haven't already. And I'd like to close with a quote from the great 20th century jazz artist, Ella Fitzgerald. Poor Ella, 
during her last few de decades, she suffered from, uh, from type 2 diabetes and diabetic foot complications. And late in her life, she actually ended up having a double amputation. And she died in the 1990s. And uh, um, she liked to say, it isn't where you came from, honey. It's where you're going that counts. So I think you can apply that to our lives as well. So thank you, Ella. So here's my, uh, my summary points. And lastly, I did not want to forget that we have a diabetic foot infection study here at the VA that Dr. Tony is the PI for. And this is reducing pedal amputations for osteomyelitis and diabetics with the use of rifampin. So if you have, if you're on the service and you have a diabetic <laughs> patient, reach out to myself or Dr. Tony and uh, uh, Dr. Tony will see if this patient can be enrolled and hopefully we can gain some further knowledge about the role of rifampin in, in uh, treatment of these patients with osteomyelitis. So that's my talk for today. I think I'm right on time and I thank you all very much. I'll take any questions.